Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Mortgage Coach Tuesday interview. Every Tuesday, 9 o'clock, I am here to interview someone amazing, top producers, authors. Today, I have my wingman for our Friday Mastermind, Mr. Todd Bookspan, joining me on this interview. What's up, Todd? Hey, not much. You know, it's uh, two Tuesdays in a row. I get the, get the call up to the big leagues. I'm super excited to be here. We're going to bring in today's special guest, Jason Hartman. Jason, welcome to the Mortgage Coach community, brother. Hey, Dave, it's great to be here. And Todd, it's great to be here too. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, talking to you guys today and covering some uh, good stuff. So, so, dude, it's been like two decades yeah. <laughs> since I've seen your smiling face. Yeah. I, guys, I met, um, God, what, Jason, was it like 20 years ago or was it like oh, 15 years it ago? Was, it was 20 years ago, easily. It, it was before that. It was more than 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah, so we're talking multiple lifetimes ago. Yeah, yeah. I was a loan officer. He was a top producing, up and coming realtor in the Irvine market, became like legend in the Irvine market. And then, dude, I don't know exactly what you've been doing, but it looks like you're just moving and shaking and changing the world of real estate. Yeah. What have you been up to? Yeah, well, I'm trying to keep up with you, man. <laughs> you're, you, you, you got a huge software empire, so uh, congratulations. And uh, yeah, basically what happened um, is when you, when you first met me, I was a top producing uh, agent for Remax, and uh, I worked there for several years. Then I bought a company, did a turnaround on that, sold it to Coldwell Banker in 2005, and then since then, I've been helping investors invest nationwide. I, like you, I really like the numbers side of the business. I like the analytical stuff, and I like working with investors. So basically, we teach people how to invest. We provide properties through our network that they can purchase, and we help them build a nationwide real estate portfolio of mostly single-family homes, but it's always housing. Then we provide ongoing software and support for them, and that's been a really fun business, and that's what I've been up to. <laughs> well, it, I am looking forward to learning from you. Uh, I know the title of the conversation we're going to have is Pedidemic Pen Investing. Yep. Gosh, I can't even say the word. But uh, coming out of quarantine investing, America's getting ready to open. So before yeah. we get into slides, stats, and facts, one thing that has been a reoccurring conversation in our community is that, in fact, Coach Phil Hart put a video in it today where he says, look, there's a lot of people who are going to be coming out of this quarantine wanting a different house, whether mm -hmm. that's a bigger house or a smaller house with a view. They're going to want a different house. Yeah. And we also think that because people have so much equity, they're going to want to take some chips off the table. Mm -hmm. So I, I can see this, this world where people are moving. They're taking some of the equity, putting it in the bank account for opportunities and risk and investing and moving up in lifestyle. What, do you, what are your thoughts on that trend? Do you think that's going to be a big deal? I think you are absolutely right, Dave. And, uh, you know, it's an interesting thing because on one side of the equation, we've got the economy, which for, you know, it's it's very unequal the way this is going, sadly. Uh, but it's a lot of people are getting hurt. A lot of people are suffering. Uh, and then on the other side of the table, we've got this mass migration trend that we're going to talk about today. And we're going to do some some math on that, look at some stats and, and go into that. And the question is, uh, when it comes to everybody watching and listening, you know, how will you fare through all of this, through this economic collapse versus this mass migration and some other trends? Um, you know, wherever you position yourself in, in the mortgage world, uh, in the investment world, will really determine your future. And this is a time where a lot of futures are, are really going to be determined. So it's, it's, a, it's a scary time, but it's a time of opportunity, uh, just the same. And it's, um, it's, it's, you know, we haven't been here in 102 years, Dave, uh, since the Spanish flu. So uh, no, nobody knows exactly what to expect. But I think we have a pretty good handle on, on some things that definitely will happen. One of the themes for our talk today, by the way, which you have alluded to in, in your question there, is that the home is the center of the universe. The home is the center of the universe. So I think uh, there's going to be a lot of things that play into that. And uh, of course, people, when they move, they're going to need mortgages. And, uh, you know, hopefully we can help, uh, help your audience make some money out of this too. Cool. So I'm going to frame one more thing, then Todd, see if you have a question and then get into the, the data and facts that you have. So 
our most of our customers are loan officers. And so they want to have ammunition to help realtors sell more homes, right? Do lunch and learn events and create content, you know, making the home the center of the universe and making smart mortgage decisions the best way to build wealth with real estate. So if you just keep that in mind while you're indirectly talking to a lot of agents, we're really talking to agents through mortgage professionals. Absolutely. Uh, Todd, anything you want to frame or ask before Jason gets into some of his stats and facts? No, I'm still trying to get my head around the fact, Dave, that you were a loan officer and that's when you and Jason met. You know, we all know you were, <laughs> we all know that you were a baller, but this is, uh, I just love that piece of this the most. Um, and, you know, I'm really just approaching this, I think, from the perspective of putting on two hats today for all of you. One is I'm going to put on my loan officer hat, right? How can we all learn from this and take it out? And then number two is my investor hat. You know, I own about a dozen properties and so I'm here to learn as well. And I want you guys to be thinking about reinvesting in yourselves as you guys come out of this. My guess is Jason's going to have some good opportunities and, you know, look at what you should be doing personally, as well as the advice you should be giving to others. Love it. So Jason, where do you want to start unpacking some of your stats and facts and some of your leadership for our community? And feel free to share your screen whenever you're ready. What you both said was a really good point in that this talk today is really geared toward the idea of how you can help clients, how you can get more clients, and then uh, also what you can do for yourself for your own investment portfolio. And I think those things from both angles will be very, very significant for you now as uh, things go forward. So without further ado, you should see my screen now, right? We do. Okay, great. Well, I want to take a look at a macro view of uh, what I call pandemic investing. Uh, and again, we are in uncharted territory here in so many ways, folks. And uh, hopefully I can help guide you through this a little bit. Uh, through my podcast, I've interviewed about 6,000 economic experts over the years, and um, and we've been podcasting for the last 16 years. So um, I don't claim to know everything by any means, but I do claim to be a really curious person who is interviewing experts all day long, five and six days a week uh, for many, many years now. And in gleaning knowledge from them, I've kind of tried to assimilate it for some things I can I can share with you today and you know discuss some of these migration trends and these very, very significant trends. I think we are in completely new territory. And I think the world has changed forever. I'm not saying that the economic recovery, you know, what kind of shape that'll be. We'll get to that in a moment in terms of, is it going to be a V, a U, uh, a swoosh like the Nike swoosh, you know, in terms of when you're looking at a chart, what that recovery will look like. I've got my own theory on that. But I do think that regardless of the economy itself, I think that the mentality of people will be impacted for years to come, if not decades to come. So I, I think this is a big deal and it's a big shift in our culture. So let's go ahead and kind of dive into that. Um, one of the, the things that I wanna to impart to you, and this has been said in different ways over the years, is that you know in a recession or a depression, the person who wins is the person who loses the least. Because, uh, the, you know, the, the pie, the, the size of the slices of that economic pie that we all have access to is going to change. It's going to shift. And so uh, maybe uh, this uh, talk today is about making more money and growing and doing big things. And that's great. Okay. Hopefully that's what it's about. But at the very least, let's make it about losing the least because economics is a relative game. And even when you're in the situation of just treading water, if you are treading water and you are maintaining your position and other people are uh, sinking and not maintaining their position, well, relatively speaking, you're doing well. So congratulations. So that will be uh, the, the minimal goal for today's talk. Um, you know, the Chinese have a, uh, a word, and you know, I learned this when I was 17 years old from Dennis Waitley. Uh, their symbol for crisis is similar to the symbol for opportunity. And the literal translation of this is that crisis, crisis is an opportunity riding the dangerous wind. 
So that's kind of an interesting to think about, uh, interesting thing to think about today. We are in the middle of a crisis, but out of that crisis, there will be many, many opportunities. And I'm sure that Dave has explored that with you on other episodes, and you are uh, seeing many of those opportunities appear already. So I'm here to share with you uh, more of those today. The first thing we've got to do, though, is we've always got to manage our own mental state, right? We've got to manage our own psychology. That's the most important thing because our psychology, uh, number one, keeps this sort of self-fulfilling loop that goes on in our own heads. The late Senator from California many years ago, S.I. Hayakawa, he wrote a book on self-fulfilling prophecy. And he said this, and it's an interesting statement. He said, the self-fulfilling prophecy is something that is neither true nor false, but is capable of becoming true if it is believed. Capable of becoming true if it is believed, right? And so we all do sort of make our own future, right, out of our mentality. And so a couple of things that we can do to just gain control of our own mindset. And this is infectious to our clients and our prospects. And, uh, you know, the, if we're out there calling on realtors or refinance clients, this is infectious, right? So number one, stay calm. Number two, keep good counsel. So you're following the mortgage coach, you're listening to Dave's show, you're hopefully filling your mind with good information and information that is seeking opportunity, right? And keep your eye on the ball. Keep your eye on the ball because there are many opportunities today and we've got to keep our eye focused on that ball, right? And always ask what I call the Jason Hartman question. (laughs) Now, I didn't call it that in the first place, but many of my podcast listeners dubbed it that years ago. And that question is a really simple question. And it's a question we should ask ourselves in every area of life, in everything, we should always ask, whenever we're confronted with something, we should ask ourselves, compared to what? Compared to what? What is the comparison? Okay, if you think, well, times are bad, we're in a crisis. Well, compared to what? Is it, you know, if if you live in the United States, you know, if you compare this to living in China or living in Ethiopia, I mean, you know, what is it compared to? How good or bad are things, right? That helps us judge when we ask that question, compared to what? The last tip, take action. The world belongs to people who take action. That's always been the case. It'll never change. That's always been the case. Never be paralyzed by whatever is going on. So as I mentioned, I learn from all these thought leaders by interviewing them all day long. And that's what I do on my podcast. Yogi Berra had a great quote. He said, the future ain't what it used to be, (laughs) right? And that is certainly true now because things have shifted dramatically. I'm a big fan of futurists. And Many years ago, right around the time, probably when I met you, Dave, <laughs> I, uh, I remember reading the book that was pretty popular back then, an old book called Megatrends by a guy named John Nesbitt. And here's one of the things that John Nesbitt used to talk about, and this is significant for you and your clients, okay, this, this significant thing. He talked about how people way back then, he, he published this book in the 80s, okay, he talked about how people now had the choice to live in what he called quality of life areas. He lived in Telluride, Colorado, and ran his publishing empire out of his office in Telluride, Colorado, not living in Chicago, LA, New York, San Francisco, or any big city, right? Not needing to live in those places. And the big technology, John Nesbitt was able to take advantage of at that time, guess what that technology was that allowed him to live anywhere he wanted? The technology of the day was Federal Express. That was the hot technology. It wasn't the internet. (laughs) It was Federal Express, okay? And then I read another futurist book a few years later by Faith Popcorn that was called The Popcorn Report. And Faith Popcorn had this thing that she said, technology had changed everything. This was in the 90s, by the way. And and Faith Popcorn was saying that, you know, things are really changing now. And 
one of the things that is a big technological change is ca causing this trend that she called cocooning. Cocooning was the trend. And by the way, cocooning is back with the pandemic, okay? So the technology of the day Faith Popcorn was talking about that led to cocooning, where people huddle up in their houses and stay put and don't go out as much as they used to, that technology was home theater systems, where people could have a nice big screen TV and a nice sound system to go with it. People wouldn't need to go to the movie theaters. They wouldn't go to Broadway plays as much. They could watch it, in, you know, get all that entertainment at home. They wouldn't go to concerts as much, right? And cocooning, the technology that enabled that home theater systems, okay? So then another book that was a huge influence on me was called Power Shift by the late Alvin Toffler. And Alvin Toffler, in this book, The Seminal Idea, which is still a great book, I highly recommend this book, talked about the three forms of power that have been impacting the world since the beginning of time. The number one form of power, the ability to inflict violence, the ability to hurt somebody, right? I, I, it's terrible. It's barbaric. But that was a form of power. You could control things if you could, if you were a warlord, if you could inflict violence, right? The second higher grade form of power after that was capital. And, and, you know, we know from the Industrial Revolution and the Rockefellers and the Carnegies and the, the Vanderbilts and all the rest, right, and the Mellons, that the ability to use capital was a form of power, right? But unfortunately, these two forms of power, violence and capital, were defective and they were flawed because, you know, eventually, if, you, if you're a bully, right, and you're a warlord, you know, you eventually destroy the thing you're trying to control, right, at the end of the day. So that doesn't work. Violence is terrible. Capital, even the wealthiest person will run out of money, right? But the highest grade form of power, that third form of power, was information. And the interesting thing about information is that information can be used by two parties at the same time. And it doesn't, it, you don't lose any information, right? So one side could have information, and then you could have information too. And both of you can use that in your transaction or in your dispute, right? In, and that is the highest grade form of power, information. So we're going to talk about information today and how that impacts our choices. Now, Another book uh, is called The Fourth Turning by William Strauss and Neil Howe. And they predicted that at, you know, the, the timing isn't exact, but at the end of this decade, uh, and really now, we were in that period of what they call the fourth turning, where there are very, very significant changes. And this book is kind of complex. So, I won't go into it too much here, but maybe many of you watching or listening have been familiar with these books, and I just wanted to, to kind of mention them. So let's talk about some big ideas. Dave and Todd, feel free to interrupt me at any time. I know there are questions coming through in the chat, or if you have any questions, chime in, but I, so I do want to go into one, some big ideas. One, one quick thought before you go on. So first sure. of all, I love this. I feel like I'm sitting in on a university-level class on investing in real estate. So I'm loving what you're doing here. And, and no student uh, loan debt either. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah. Uh, mortgage Coach Community, when you heard the word information, I hope you're connecting the dots to your total cost analysis because that is where you have the ability to ask the client questions. What are your assumptions on rates? What are your assumptions on real estate? And then personalize that and show them how their decisions over time will play out. So just think of, you are uniquely positioned to have a level of information that is, you know, gives you a massive competitive advantage. So keep it going, brother. Yeah, excellent. And by the way, uh, I want to mention, I loved the Mortgage Coach software. And I had a couple of mortgage businesses over the years, but I was mainly in the real estate side. And we would use the adjustable versus fixed rate analysis uh, component a lot. We're not in that type of market nowadays, but back then we were. And that was, that was really helpful to clients in making decisions 
there were some other like refi analysis components and things like that that I, I'd use them all the time and I, I loved it. That was just a, a, a very handy product that made us a lot of money back in the day. So the first big idea I'd like to share with you is something that's pretty rare and this is called supply demand shock. Now, we all know that in the economy, usually a recession or a depression is caused when demand declines. So times get tough. People don't have money. There isn't a wealth effect. Their stocks aren't going up. Their house isn't going up in value. Or they lose their job and they feel poorer. So they stop buying things, right? And, and that's an issue where we have demand shock. The demand collapses, right? But occasionally, and this is rare, we have something we call supply demand shock. And that's what I predict we are seeing now a little bit and we will see more of. What is supply demand shock? Well, it's probably best if I illustrate it with a little study I did. This is not a formal study. It was just something I did because I, I thought it was interesting. And it's looking at airline prices. And I was looking as the uh, quarantines began at what was happening to the price of airline tickets. And I was just, I wasn't taking any flights. I'm used to traveling like three times a month. And I'm kind of enjoying this stay, staying at home, not going anywhere. It's, it's been a nice change for me, at least. And what I noticed at first, and if you look at this graph of the last 60 days, now, this is as of maybe two weeks ago, I ran this chart here. And this is from Google Flights. And I simply looked up a flight from Miami to LAX, right? Common flight, nothing complicated about that one. And I live in Palm Beach, Florida now. So, you know, that's a, a flight I might take, right? And before the quarantine started, here was the cost of that flight. You know, it was generally around $325 or so to take that flight, okay? And then you saw the price start to drop here as the lockdown started and everybody was worried about flying. They didn't want to get on, a, on, a, on an airplane. You couldn't socially distance. It was a risky behavior. So the, the, the airline industry just plummeted. Obviously, we, we know that. And you saw it kind of bounce around these lower prices where the tickets got really cheap at one point. And, you know, you, you could get, get these tickets if you were lucky for like $50. Okay. <laughs> it was amazing. But then what we saw, okay, so first remember demand falls off and there's a lot of supply out there. So the prices go down, right? That's the first phase. But then you have the supply fall off. All the airlines start grounding their airplanes. They start parking them. They put them in storage. They cancel these routes. And then supply falls off, okay? So then you see the price go back up. And look at this. When I ran this two weeks ago, the price of this flight was $437. It was considered high by Google Flights, okay? Because the supply had fallen off. So this is what's called supply demand shock. We had this in the 70s with oil, okay? With gasoline prices, right? And uh, it's an interesting phenomenon and it stinks. It's a, it's a bad thing. And we've seen with this, we've seen supply chains get disrupted. So supply demand shock, one big idea, okay? Trickle up economics. So we've all heard of trickle down economics, mostly referring to Ronald Reagan and supply side economics and, and how, you know, the wealth trickles down through the system is that theory. And that's fine. Now what we have is something I call trickle up economics, meaning that you, you see, for example, in the real estate world, right? You see, okay, people lose their job. So they ask for a forbearance on their mortgage. Or if they're a renter, they ask their landlord for a break and they stop paying their rent. And, and it's like this game of hot potato where the renter says, hey, I can't pay. And 
then there might be a city rule or a county rule that says you can't evict them right now, okay? And then you go to your lender and say, hey, my tenant isn't paying me, so I can't pay the mortgage. And the lender says, no problem, we'll give you a forbearance, right? And then uh, what do they do? They go to their bondholders and, and start defaulting on bonds, right? And it's this game of hot potato where every contract in the world is being renegotiated. We saw this during the Great Recession, where it was like this trickle up, where you know the first person at the, on the food chain says they can't pay, then they go to the next person, the next person, and all of this sort of trickles up to uh, more and more economic hardship, okay? So that's something that is occurring. I predict that there will be a huge either expansion of the Section 8 uh, rental assistance program for housing or some kind of new housing assistance program. Uh, I think, like it or not, folks, we are moving into an era of the rich get richer, more wealth inequality, uh, universal basic income. I had Andrew Yang, the presidential candidate on my show, and you know I I'm a libertarian-leaning person. I have a lot of libertarian friends. Even they believe that we probably need to move toward a universal basic income concept. And it's like totally against their philosophy. It's really surprised me. Modern monetary theory. Another thing that I don't agree with, okay? But this is the idea that you can pretty much just print and create money forever, spend without much of a tether on it in terms of government spending. And uh, uh, there's not much of a consequence for it. Now, we all know that the the usual consequence for this is inflation. And I think there are definitely inflationary pressures in the system because of this idea. And they will continue. But will they be as significant as the spending, as all of these multi-trillion dollar and more to come bailouts? I don't know. You know, it's it's a it's a very hard thing to tell. You know, the idea of a digital dollar. Early on in this crisis, we saw articles about how money, literally money, cash, was dirty, and how you could catch COVID-19 from handling dollar bills or coins. You know, there's a lot of this movement. I have a, another one of my podcasts called The Cryptocast, where I uh, discuss cryptocurrencies and things like that. And I'd love to be wrong about this, but I'm not a fan of Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency, really. And, and the reason is, is that the two most powerful entities the world has ever known are governments and central banks. You know, there's an old saying, don't never bet against the Fed. And I agree with that. We want to align our interests with these two most powerful entities the human race has ever known, especially the U.S. government and the U.S. central bank, the Federal Reserve. So the cryptocurrency that will win the game is going to be the dollar that's digital. It'll be a, a digital dollar, a cryptocurrency dollar. It won't be Bitcoin. It won't be Ethereum. It won't be any of those. And by the way, I'd love to be wrong about this because I would love nothing more than to see a decentralized cryptocurrency win the day, but I just don't think I'm going to be wrong about that. The almighty dollar, okay? The dollar is the world's reserve currency. The U.S. government is in a very enviable position on the world stage. You know, there has been a lot of talk about how, you know, the government cannot keep spending so irresponsibly. You know, you can't just print money and pump it into the system and not have consequences. You know, the Chinese will say, look, we're not going to buy your treasury bills anymore. Russia and China and Brazil will trade outside of the dollar. They won't respect that the dollar is the world reserve currency. Uh, wrong. <laughs> okay, that's just not going to happen anytime soon. Why is that? Well, because it's not just about the math. It's about a lot more than math. Namely, and, and maybe the first thing is the military. You know, the gold bugs and the cryptocurrency people will say things like, well, the dollar's not backed by anything. It's fiat money. Okay, yeah, you're kind of right, but not really. I mean, the dollar is backed by aircraft carriers, nuclear missiles. It's 
backed quite well by a lot of things. The United States, I think, has 18 aircraft carriers, the most of any country in the world. Do you think that a government, when understand this, the main product of any government is its currency, its dollar, okay, or its yen, or its euro, okay, well, the euro's got multiple governments, but you get the idea, okay? The, the, the government will not allow some outside force to come in and steal the show from their currency. They are going to maintain the sanctity of their currency. You can control a lot of the world when you control the currency, okay? And remember something else. When, uh, you know, people talk about how the dollar will diminish, it will, uh, you know, it will continue to be debased. Yeah, it will slowly, but not entirely. Uh, because the U.S. Uh, is owed a lot of money. And those debts are denominated in dollars. The biggest taxing agency on earth is the IRS. And the IRS requires you to pay your debts to them in dollars. Okay? This increases demand for the dollar. When you, when you owe the lender or the taxing agency in dollars, the dollar becomes stronger, okay? Now, another trend is more of a psychological one, and it's post-traumatic stress disorder. This is a huge deal because I say that this is not going to be something that will be forgotten anytime soon. Even after the pandemic is over, there's a vaccine, there are better treatments, there are, you know, society has adjusted, the economy's recovered, so what? People will still have some degree of suspicion, some degree of concern that maybe they will be infected by this or some other virus, right? You know, coronavirus is not the first thing. We've had many of these. You remember SARS, swine flu, mad cow disease. I mean, there's been all these things, right? This is not the first, and this will be with us for a long time, and it will significantly affect the real estate market, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Now, when we talk about the real estate market, understand that there are three types of real estate markets. The whole world, the whole planet can be divided into three types of markets, linear markets, cyclical markets, and hybrid markets. Okay, linear cyclical hybrid markets. Whenever you hear these talking heads on the news media and you hear them talk about the housing market or the real estate market, understand that those generalizations are just faulty. They don't work. Okay, you've got to divide things into at least three categories. So, linear markets, these are the boring markets that aren't very newsworthy. They're not talked about very much. They're the markets we specialize in, the markets where we sell properties, okay? Like on jasonhartman.com, you can see a list of these markets. But generally, they're, they're markets like Little Rock, Arkansas, Atlanta, Georgia, maybe, you know, Jacksonville, Florida, Ocala, Florida, Indianapolis, Indiana. You know, we've got many of these markets all around the country. They're all on my website, okay? Those are linear markets. These are prudent markets where investors can make a good yield, a good return on their money, okay? Now, cyclical markets are the opposite. They're mostly the markets where I've lived most of my life and where Dave has too, okay? They're the West Coast of the United States, the expensive Northeastern markets, South Florida, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, okay? These are expensive places. They're very nice places to live, but they do not make sense for investing, okay? And interestingly, these markets, and by the way, the expensive Northeastern markets would include places like New York, Boston, Washington, D.C., and the rest, okay? These places generally tend to be high-density areas. That's important, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Cyclical markets, because real estate is very expensive there, tend to be high-density living environments. Even Los Angeles, where I grew up, is a cyclical market, and it's high-density, even though it's still suburban and sprawling, it's also high-density at the same time. Not like New York City, but high-density enough. Very important to consider density. Hybrid markets is in between the two. Examples of hybrid markets, Denver, Austin, 
Austin, Texas, places like that, okay? They're kind of in between the two, okay? So hope that makes sense. Now, home is the center of the universe. This is hugely important because like Dave was saying when he introduced me, is that people are going to be making a lot of decisions after we come out of these quarantines. And one of the things they've already been either very, well, mostly very disappointed with, is that they've been locked up in their houses. And, you know, they're looking around thinking, gosh, you know, we've got mom and dad, and they both had careers before, and maybe they went to an office, or maybe at least one of them did. And now we've got two kids, and they're now at home, and everybody's studying at home. This house is too small. We need basically four home offices now, or before maybe we needed zero or maybe one, okay? Now these people are tripping over each other and they need a quiet place to work, okay? Uh, also, the gym is closed. So they need a place to work out. So remote work and remote working out are significant trends. And this means, I believe, that people will leave high-density areas and there will be a mass migration out of that tiny condo in LA, New York, Seattle, downtown San Diego, San Francisco, Chicago, Miami, and they want to live in a larger, lower-priced suburban home where they don't have to get in an elevator and where they're never going to use mass transit, the two most dangerous areas for a possible infection, mass transit and elevators, okay? Not to mention every place you go in one of those high-priced, cyclical, high-density markets is crowded. The Starbucks, the grocery store, everywhere. It's all crowded, dictated by the price of real estate. So the rise of suburbia is a big trend that I'm predicting, the rise of suburbia. Now, I've been to 87 countries. I'm a big traveler. Some of those countries I've been to many, many times. I've really made it a point to travel. And um, uh, one of the things that you notice when you go around the world is that the idea of suburban living, the idea of suburbia is a uniquely American concept. You know, in other parts of the world, yeah, they have suburban places, but not much. You know, when you go around the world, you kind of either live in a city that's high density or you live in a rural area and you live in the country. It's kind of one or the other. Suburbia is this in-between area and America is very suburban, starting with Levittown in the Northeast after World War II. You know, these suburban communities we're all familiar with. Most of us probably live in them. I say there's going to be a mass migration to these markets. And I'm going to show you some math, time permitting, on how big I think this trend is, okay? There's also going to be a move toward a simpler life, okay? I think people have, uh, at least I have, done some reflection during this time where, you know, I can't travel. Personally, for me, I've gotten a little more centered, I think, during this time. It's been kind of good for me. It's been a good break. I know a lot of people are struggling with it, but I think it's definitely caused everybody to rethink their life to some degree. And the simpler life concept that I think is coming has wide-ranging impacts on the economy. And we will get to that in a moment. I'm going to smile for that picture, Dave. <laughs> that was great. Uh, so so by, the, by the way, I, I know I'm loving this. I know Todd's loving it. Guys, if you have questions, put them below. We may go a little over because you said, I'm going to get to the data if time yeah. permits. Well, right. Bro, you're on Mortgage Coach. We need to get to the data. Yeah. So if, guys, <laughs> get ready for this to possibly go over a little bit. But keep good, going, bro. Good stuff. Yeah, yeah it's good stuff. Okay, so I'll, I'm going to rush through this, get to some more data, okay? Uh, or some data. Stagflation. It's going to be the way we come out of this, okay? Stagflation is this crappy economic situation where you have oddly, and this is an odd one like supply-demand shock, where you have high inflation and at the same time, you have high unemployment. So it's not fun. And we really saw this in the 70s, okay? And I think that's what we are ultimately going to see is stagflation. We're going to see a move toward more socialism, like it or not. 
the government is getting a lot bigger through this and a lot more intrusive in our lives. That's the way it is. George Orwell wrote the book 1984. And uh, wait till you see what's coming with these tracking apps and the way we're going to be tracked and our, you know, we're, we're, they're going to know if we're together in big crowds or not based on where our phones are and all kinds of stuff. So a lot of people are not going to like it, but it's, it's, it's where it's going. My general philosophy of investment allocation is a 70, 10, and 10, and 10, not like 80, 10, and 10 <laughs> in the financing world, but 70, 10, 10, 10 ratio where uh, grow and flow uh, is the major part of your portfolio. For me, that's income properties, cheap houses in these suburban markets we recommend take 10%, speculate a little bit, 10% hedge, maybe some crypto, maybe some Bitcoin and gold, and then 10% cash reserves. Okay. I talk about that a lot on the podcast. Um, We've seen retail spending decline by the biggest number in seven decades. It is absolutely shocking what's going on. This chart is a moving target every single week. We know unemployment's high. I don't have to tell you much more about that. Okay. But you know, look at that. Now this chart's already out of date, and uh, you know it's it's going to get a little worse before it uh, before it starts to improve. Housing starts down, okay, and and then the recovery. Okay, let's talk about how the recovery might look. This is important. So a lot of people are hoping for a V-shaped recovery, meaning it goes down fast. We've certainly seen that already, and it'll come back fast. Hopefully, that's a hopeful scenario. Others are saying, well, it might be a U-shaped recovery where we're down in the bottom of that U now, and we ride along the bottom for quite a while, and that's really no fun, um, uh, and it, it just takes longer. The L-shaped recovery or the swoosh, like the Nike-shaped recovery, they're all possibilities. So there, you know, most people are hoping it'll be a V. What I think, though, is I think it will look like a modified square root sign. If you're not looking at the screen, visualize the old square root sign from your math class in high school or college, okay? But the square root sign, you know, it goes down in a V, and then it comes up, but it comes up higher. I think, unfortunately, there's going to be a modification to this square root sign. It's going to be a square root sign where we go down in the V as we already have. We come up, but we don't go up as much as we were. In fact, the economy is smaller than it used to be. And I think that's the economy we're coming into. I think we are coming into a smaller economy and uh, we need to prepare for that. Okay. And there are, there are definitely ways we can. So if the economy is smaller, like I opened with, the question is, are there some trends? So the economy is smaller, that's bad, right? We get that idea. But are there some trends that we can take advantage of that regardless of what the economy is doing, we're going to grow and we're going to make more money and our net worth will grow through that? And I think there are. So let's let's take a look at some of those, okay? Okay, so uh, there was a show many years ago when I was a little kid called The Waltons, and it sort of profiled the simple life during the Great Depression in the 30s. Then here's a more modern show <laughs> with uh, Paris Hilton, and uh, and that was the simple life where they uh, these rich kids became uh, you know farmers working on the farm. But here's the thing you have to realize: seventy percent of the U.S. economy is based on consumption, on consumer spending. And I believe consumer spending is going to stay lower. It is not going to get back to the level it was at uh, for quite a long time, and thus the smaller economy. And so again, we need to overshadow that smaller economy by using some techniques. Let's look at PTSD for just a moment, okay? And this is a CBS News poll, and it says, if the stay-at-home orders were lifted today, would you return to public places? 48% of them say no, unless the outbreak was over. Uh, 39% maybe, 13% definitely, regardless of what happens. Those are the people, the risk takers, okay? And and I think this thing, this is going to be with us for a long time, this kind of thinking, okay? Um, you, you look at travel and, you know, it's fallen off the map. We don't need to go into that too much. But again, the opposing forces in life, in the economy, 
are deflation versus inflation, okay? And basically there we have the, the deflationary forces of technology and globalization. Those are deflationary. And then we have the inflationary forces of uh, bad fiscal and monetary policy, too much government spending and the Federal Reserve pumping money into the system. Those are very inflationary, inflationary forces, okay? But our choice is I think we all know we are definitely in a recession, if not a depression. How long will it go? And will the migration trend overshadow that in the real estate market? Okay, so uh, let's look at that uh, more specifically. Let me just go ahead a little bit. Okay, so um, real estate has always been based on these three primary value drivers, location, 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 right? And I think that is changing. Back in 2012 on my podcast, I used to say that location is less meaningful than it's ever been before, than it's ever been in human history. And the reason I said that back, starting back in 2012 is because of the self-driving car, making location less important, okay? But now, uh, and I, I was just on TV talking about this on RT, uh, this huge six factors of pent up or shadow demand that will change the real estate market pretty darn significantly. Okay. So, number one, roommates. Just roommates alone are a hugely significant factor. Picture this you got two uh, professional roommates living together. They both went to an office every day. They're in a two bedroom, two bath place, probably a condo or apartment usually. And for the past 60 days or so, they've been at home living together. Now, they're digital workers, they're information workers, so they can work at home, okay? And guess what? Most of the coffee shops are closed, so they're really working at home. And they're stumbling over each other. They don't have space. One says to the other, hey, you know, uh, I think one of us need to move because, you know, I really need to make that second bedroom a home office. And the other says, you know, I was thinking the same thing. I need a home office too. And so one of us has to move out. And so, uh, you know, you look at uh, just in 2012, 32% of non-romantic adults living together, roommates, okay? 32%. If they split up, that literally doubles the demand for housing. You double housing demand just on roommates splitting up minor thing it may seem like, right? Okay, some people have speculated that in nine months, there may be a baby boom <laughs> because uh, people are uh, are living together and they're cra cooped up at home and hey, they do not do what comes naturally, right? Others consider they may, there may be a divorce tsunami uh, like there was in Wuhan, China, by the way, uh, after those lockdowns. A lot of people got divorced and are going through divorces. And, uh, you know, remember Gilligan's Island, right? A couple weeks in isolation with your family, what could go wrong? <laughs> so uh, now let's look at urban dwellers. These are people that live in what is considered to be urban areas. And maybe this will be the final concept I throw at you because time is limited, right? But, but just consider this. You've got 327 million people or so in the US. 84% of those people live in what are considered to be urban areas. Now, on my screen, average population density in the US is 87 people per square mile. Average population density in metropolitan areas, 283 people per square mile. Average population of New York City, the densest area in the country, 27,000 people per square mile. Do you see how significant that is? Now, if these people in New York City start to move, and it's not just New York City, it's any high density area, and remember, elevator, mass transit, those are the two biggest danger zones of all, right? They, that flushes out millions of people that move from high density living to low density living. Only a small percentage of them have to move to see this be very significant. Uh, so let me just get to my back of the napkin math and uh, we'll probably wrap up with this, I'm guessing, okay? So there are about 268 million urban people in the US. That's the 84%, 
Okay. Uh, how many of these cannot socially distance? Most of them cannot do that. Okay. What if just 15%, and remember, this is back of the napkin math, so it's very rough, okay, want to move, if they want to move out of those high-density areas, okay? That's 40 million people, okay? Now, if we have, if we need, if we divide that by two, say it's two people living together at a time, that's 20 million suburban units are needed for them to move to. Folks, we have already had a housing shortage. <laughs> now, there are a total of about 128 million housing units today, just so you have a point of reference there. We've had a housing shortage for many, many years. Long before the pandemic, people were talking about a housing shortage. So this is a hugely significant trend. And if you look at high-rise living, okay, a mid-rise is considered anything five stories or higher, and a high-rise is anything 12 stories or higher. Now, this is just the rental units. This is not condos, so it's just rentals only. There are 2.3 million high-rise rentals where people are pretty much forced to take an elevator, more than five stories, okay? What if 15% of those people want to move? That's 340,000 housing units needed we're assuming none of them are roommates, so you don't double housing demand there. We're just saying they all want to move, and they're going to move to a single-family home in a suburban environment. Only 15%. That's 340,000 people, or, or housing units needed, sorry, housing units. If you divide that among 50 suburban areas, that's another 7,000 uh, units needed in each market where there's already a huge housing shortage. So, and this is, by the way, all these stats are from Yardy Matrix, okay? Carl Icahn has talked about how he's shorting commercial real estate. The Google searches over the past 15 years, these are monthly searches for work at work from home. They've skyrocketed as soon as the lockdown started. So there are some big trends here, guys. You probably have some questions, so fire away. So, Todd, I'm going to let you go first as both an investor and any action items you have for the mortgage coach community after watching this. Well, definitely the first action item is, is to take a look at those statistics, right? Those, um, you know, six uh, areas that he talked about why people may be moving. I think that that's really critical. I think, Jason, really, you know, for this group, where can we learn more? I mean, I, obviously, you tried to shove as much as you could into an hour. Yeah, I think you put I it up right there. <laughs> that's really it. We all have a thirst for more knowledge. Yeah personal and professional reasons. Yeah, absolutely. So my main website is jasonhartman.com. My main podcast is called The Creating Wealth Show. And we publish that five days a week. It's on iTunes and any podcast platform. Just type Jason Hartman and you'll find all my shows. And then I've got a special website called pandemicinvesting.com. So pandemicinvesting.com, where I got some free stuff for you. So uh, take advantage of that. And, uh, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions or or whatever, or, you know, go a little longer if you want to cover some more stuff. But uh, I tried to talk as fast as I could. So <laughs> uh, you were, you were, you were awesome. So I, a few people have asked for slides. Are you willing to share the slides that you have? Oh, yeah, community? yeah, yeah. They're in the pandemic investing uh, website. So you can get them there. And uh, you can get a transcript of one of the early uh, interviews I did, as well as the video of that interview. And that's about I don't know, two hours long or so. Uh, so it's it's more depth. Um, one of the challenges we have with this stuff is the news is changing so quickly, Dave and Todd, that we, we you know, it, it's like, yeah, you publish something in the next week, like there's new data, right? And so so that is a challenge. But, you know, there there are core principles. If you don't get too lost in like the constant changes of the data, the core principle is, look, you've got, tens of millions of people, well, hundreds of millions, really, living in high-density environments where they can't socially distance. Assuming, and this is an assumption, that people are going to remember this, that there will be some level of PTSD, that people are going to view the future with some degree of suspicion, that they're going to want to socially distance, that that is a trend that will be with us for a long time. And plus, the other thing is, you know, there's that old 
story of how the emperor has no clothes, right? The emperor, we're discovering as a world, as a global population, that the emperor has no clothes in many areas. Many people that thought they couldn't work from home have figured out a way, okay? So they can work remotely, like John Nesbitt with FedEx in the 80s, Faith Popcorn in the 90s with home theater systems, right? So we figured out we can work remotely and live anywhere we want. Many more people have figured that out that didn't think it was possible. Employers have figured that out. And we've also figured out that we don't need to go to a college or a university campus and pay 50 grand a year and be enslaved with student loan debt. People can take their classes online and, uh, and that's what they're doing. So, uh, you know, th- these things all mean live where you want. You can live in a suburban environment and you'll be fine with it. So these are, these are big trends. I think so we're got, so let's go. Let's asking. let's let's go five minutes over. Uh, Todd, what you were going to bring in a question? Yeah, two questions from the group. One person's asking, you know, what what do you see happening with all the empty office spaces as people continue to work from home? Good question. Um, you know, I commercial real estate is a disaster. The office spaces will not be refilled completely. You know, it's like the retail apocalypse is now happening in the office market. So the outlook for office space and retail properties is not good at all. It's also not good for hotels. Obviously, the restaurant business, that's not good. Uh, They say 30 to 50% of all restaurants will just not reopen. And if they have to run it, you know, 25 or 50% capacity, they can't make any money. So it's going out to dinner may become a very expensive luxury uh, that, that, you know, we haven't been used to. So uh, some of the offices eventually, eventually, and this is going to take a long time, uh, zoning laws will change. City councils will get flexible. They will change zoning. And some of those offices will be repurposed in a long time. It, it's a slow process to residential. They'll turn some of those into apartments and condos. But again, if they're high density and they're high rise, the outlook for that isn't good. But if they're like low rise suburban garden style office properties with, you know, two or three floors, those, those could do better and they could, they could have a successful conversion. But again, that's a very slow process. So don't count on anything real soon, but it'll happen. So, so what are your thoughts on this advice? For every mortgage coach member that's on this, you, you are a referral based local mortgage professional in a specific city. And you have a certain geograph that you're doing a market with, uh, you're doing your market. And, and, and the, some of these trends are going to play in your favor in some of your markets. And some of these trends are not going to play in your favor. Yeah. But what are your thoughts that every mortgage professional should mastermind with some of the top realtors in their market, identify the trends that are going to most impact the market they're in, yeah. kind of create categories on different types of real estate in the market. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, be proactive where you see risk, people either moving down or moving out. You are being proactive at going to that, that segment with, hey, let's do a move up analysis. Hey, let's do a move out of right. the city analysis. Mm-hmm. And, and you're doing a combination of lifestyle and financial analysis using a total cost analysis Absolutely. to help that family yeah future cast, what's it look like? And I I think there's just a lot of opportunities given the equity situation in America that people can leverage that equity, put more money in the bank and move into the lifestyle they want. One more question. You know, being, being using mortgage coach, the whole idea of the mortgage coach concept is to really become an advocate, an advisor, a consultant for your customers. I think there's a lot of opportunity to combine some of the stuff we've talked about today with the mortgage coach software and, and really become that like trusted advisor for people. They'll appreciate that. If you're thinking big, if you're thinking outside the box and you're talking about some of these trends. And by the way, I had Dottie Herman, the uh, CEO of Douglas Elliman real estate, a huge New York real estate brokerage on my show two weeks ago. And, you know, she was very candid, by the way, about people leaving New York and other high density markets, which is not in her self interest. But, you know, if you're in one of these high density markets, you know, you can still make a lot of money on the trend of, of the migration while it lasts. But for the long game, you know, think about repositioning maybe your own life 
to some extent in getting out of these areas, you know, as a mortgage person using mortgage coach, using all the software tools you have, you can, you can work anywhere probably. Right. So think about that. Yeah. Really good, really good point. So guys, if you have questions, put them down below, make sure you go to jasonhartman.com. We've put a link, uh, subscribe to everything that's interesting to you. This guy is super smart, super well studied. Todd, as Mr. Win by Noon, for all the loan officers that have a Win by Noon planner, or they have a planner, what what are the notes that you think they should have taken here, and what are the actions that they should do as a follow up to today's session? You know, I outlined all of the info on you know just the trends, right? Because I feel like that's what I can bring out to the real estate community and to the loan officers and the Win by Noon community as well as the real estate agents there. And so I think that those trends are were great. I loved um, that that information, right? Information is power. And so I think that just go back through your notes. I mean, mine is, you know, two thirds of a page long of, of what I've got. And then I think the other action plan is, is to obviously go to the website. Um, what was it? Pandemicinvesting.com. And I listened to that, that two hour, you know, interview there where he goes deeper and the other transcripts, because I think there's more for all of us to learn. And so, you know, as always, you just have to schedule time right now. We're, we're so busy reacting, whether you're still working from home or, um, you know, you've got, you know, a little bit of privacy, like I have in my empty office every day, you know, make sure that you're really being targeted with your time, right? What gets scheduled gets done. And I still am talking to loan officers every day who are just reacting to emails and everything that's going on versus being proactive and planned. And I think this is your opportunity to grow. I think those of you who actually spend the time to become more disciplined with your time are the ones who are going to grow the most as we come out of this over the next uh, weeks and months. And, you know, you heard it from Jason, it's not going to change that fast. Um, and so, be proactive, be ready to, to take your market share as you grow. So guys, tomorrow at three o'clock Pacific, I'm going to be with Craig Sewing on the American Tree TV, American Dream TV pay, um, Facebook group. And we're going to be doing a live on Dan's most updated forecast and predictions around interest rates in the market. So don't miss that three o'clock tomorrow. I've put a post in our group on it. Uh, if you got value from today's call, give us a like, whether you're watching this in our YouTube channel or you're watching this in our Facebook group. If you got some value, let us know. If you have more questions for Jason, let us know. If you want me to bring him back and interview him again, let me know what questions you'd have. Jason, I'll give you the last thought as we wrap up today's call. Any, any last words of wisdom? Yeah, thanks, Dave. You know, just uh, don't don't, uh, like uh, Todd was saying, you know, don't be too mired in like living day to day through this, you know, the, the information's changing so quickly, have a plan, you know, keep moving, to, keep your eye on the ball, which was one of my original things I said, and, uh, and always ask yourself compared to what, and just plan for these trends. America is moving after this, folks. And there's going to be a lot of people that need new mortgages, a lot of people that need your good good advice and consulting and, uh, you know, good, good reports from the software and so forth. And invest in these areas, get ahead of this tidal wave. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what we've been helping people do for 16 years. And you can, you can see those different markets that we like at jasonhartman.com in the properties section. And, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of good will come out of this. A, a lot of technological advancement is coming out of it. And it's a time of uh, despair if you want to make it that, but it's also a time of huge opportunity if you want to make it that. So you get to decide, you know, I just want to wish everybody the best, stay well, happy investing. And thanks for having me. Love it. So guys, I wrote down a lot of notes, but two things that were just a theme of this. Home is the center of the universe. And, and guys, we know more about a family than any other financial professional. We have both the asset side and the income side. And then the other theme I pulled from this is compared to what? And as a mortgage coach, that's what you are uniquely prepared to do. Compare, you know, should I do with alone with points or without points? Should I rent? Or should I own? Should I move up or should I move down? Compared to what, guys? So write that down. Become a master at helping people build wealth with real estate by being a master of showing them how to compare things. So, dude, you killed it. I really appreciate the wisdom you brought. Uh, we went a little over. Apologies to you guys, but I think it was worth it. Jason Hartman, till next time, brother. 
<laughs> I love it. <laughs> the fist bump. <laughs> Virtual right. fist hey, bump. Let's, yeah. let's do the elbow bump. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Little, yeah. little elbow bump. <laughs> Got it. Hey, Todd, thank you for joining me today, brother. Take care, uh, everybody. This is a wrap. I missed it. All right, guys. Take care. Nice meeting you, Jason. Bye.